Um, main line is place, 7 to 9 a.m. Jay will try to get it, we'll let her on. Two welfare stickers also said outside for you to remember. I have to try to play like eight versus muscles and things like this. That's the second way to get your welfare sticker. Okay, and now I want to introduce uh, Paul Seneca, who is an active member of the Sports Act. Since being elected to Congress in 1996, our next guest has tirelessly advocated for civil rights as well as human rights, and some of the legislation that he has either authored or co-sponsored include creating a national health care system, preserving Social Security, lowering the cost of prescription drugs, and providing tax relief for working class families. Also, he has shown a steadfast commitment to environmental issues, as he has often spoken out about how protecting the environment is absolutely fundamental to preserving the life of all living things. Time and again, he has shown strong progressive leadership by consistently standing up for workers' rights, gay rights, and a variety of women's rights. As for the war in Iraq, he has continually voted against it since the very beginning. Also, he has repeatedly made the case for ending the occupation in Iraq and bringing our brave and courageous troops home. On a personal note, this man has had a tremendous influence on my life. He has inspired me to get involved and find ways to make positive change in the world. He also has given me a reason for hope, not only about the future of our country, but also about the future of our planet as well. This person that I'm speaking of was our keynote speaker and Rising Tide Award winner just two years ago, almost to the day. Since this time, he has continued to be a dynamic, visionary leader who has shown great passion about his commitment to public service, workers' rights, civil rights, human rights, universal health care, and protection of our environment. Since these are all issues that many of us here in this room work toward day in and day out, it is my opinion that there is not one person in our government who more closely represents the progressive values, goals, and vision of all of us here with the Maine People's Alliance than the man that I'm about to introduce. So it is with great pleasure that I present to you United States Congressman and 2008 presidential candidate, Dennis Kucinich. That's a very 
human quality. That when we look at circumstances that some may see as being unyielding, impenetrable, where people will say, you can't do that. You can't change that. What are you trying to do? Who do you think you are? And what you do is just summon the power of the human heart to change things. That's such a very human and at the same time very divine power that each of us has. And to get to that point of exercising it, it takes a great deal of courage. It's courage to believe. Some of you uh, will remember the writings of that great political philosopher, Lewis Carroll, <laughs> who writes of the experience of Alice in Wonderland as Alice was at a moment of maximum peril where the minions of the queen were marching upon her. These huge cars with their spirits about to do her in. And Lewis Carroll writes, that Alice had a moment of recognition. And suddenly, she goes from being little Alice and she grows to her full size. And by now, she's towering over the cards. And she sweeps out her hand and she says, who cares for you? You're nothing but a pack of cards. In that moment, Alice goes to her full size because she realized the power of her humanity, because she came to an understanding of belief in herself, because she had the courage to believe in herself, and therefore radiated that courage to transform her not only yourself, but others as well. So to uh, Representative Bryant, to Deb Felder, to Nikki, to Clint, to Rachel Calvin Ross, to your lives, and the lives of every person in this room, at one time or another, have been confronted with the question, but whether you had the courage to believe in yourself to be able to change the outcome. Because that's what we're here to do. The oft-quoted words of uh, George Bernard Shaw, some people see things as they are. I see things that never were. Or some people see things that they are and ask why. I see things that never were and ask why not. Is really an understanding of the power that we have to change things. Robert Kennedy, who used that quote often, himself said, when he confronted students in South Africa at Cape Town, just a few months before his Earthland students challenged him on, what did this man know about apartheid? How could he tell them that someday apartheid would fall? What made him think that somehow he had the answer to this person who journeyed so far and really seemed not to have any idea what these students were putting up with and what apartheid had done to the people of South Africa? Robert Kennedy challenged the students, and what he told them, he said, each time, a man or a woman stands up for an ideal, acts, 
to improve the lot of others or strikes out against injustice, he or she sends forth a tiny ripple of hope. And crossing each other from a million different centers of energy and daring, those ripples can create a current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. We understand this. And each one of us has had that moment. Well, because we have the courage to believe, we have the opportunity to be as a ripple of hope. It's that understanding that gives us transformative power that we change other people's lives and when you've ever had the chance to change one person's life, you change your own. And then you develop this capacity to keep transforming. That's what the Names of People's Alliance is all about. When you read about the advances that Maine People's Alliance has created in the environment, in civil rights, in housing, in, in so many different areas that involve people empowering themselves because of an understanding of this innate ability we have to create transformation. You come to understand why an evening like tonight is so important because it gives each of us, the ch each person here, a chance to understand the power that you have. This isn't about any one of us. It is about all of us. And so I use that as a backdrop for a discussion that certainly Representative Bryant is aware of its implications with respect to Maine. And I'm certainly aware of with respect to Maine and the rest of the country. And that is on the issue of health care. Because we're being told in Washington, you know, really, there really isn't much that we can do about this health care system because, let's face it, the insurance companies control our politics and the best that we can hope for is a health care system where the government could provide more money to subsidize the insurance companies. That's because that exactly is what the plan of a number of my good friends running for the same office and a number of my good friends in the House and Senate <coughs> happens to be. That will provide, will cover more children and will try to cover more individuals, but will do it by having the government provide more of a subsidy to the private sector. And yet we all realize that we're at a moment which calls for something that's quite different, that really is transformative in its implications. In traveling the country, I've met thousands of people who have no health insurance. I've met thousands of people who are underinsured. I'm aware that half the bankruptcies in America are directly connected to people not being able to pay the doctor bills. Three quarters of the people are actually workers who are going to bankruptcy. This health care system is not working for the people of this country. It is working for an insurance industry that is all about its own profits and not about the impact that policies have on the American people. America spends $2.2 trillion a year on health care or on health services. If all that money was spent on care, we'd have enough money to cover everyone for everything. But th think about this. 31 cents on a dollar is spent for corporate profits, stock options, executive salaries, advertising, marketing, the cost of paperwork, 15 to 30 percent in the private sector as compared to Medicare, 2 to 3 percent. That's over $600 billion, billion dollars a year. They go to the for-profit system. People are losing their homes. 
People lose their jobs, they lose their health care. Health care is the key issue at the bargaining table. Labor has been beaten down over health care benefits. People are experiencing rising premiums, rising co-pays, rising deductibles. More family, families are paying a more significant part of their individual budget for the cost of insurance. And when we are told that this is a moment for deep, a need for deep change, we're being told, as some of my friends said in a health care debate in Las Vegas two months ago, you know, we can provide more subsidy for the insurance companies to cover more people, but no, we'll never, we'll never get the bill that Dennis is talking about, H.R. 676, the kind of percentage bill, well, that can never happen. You'll never get it passed. Why would they say that? Because there is this belief in Washington that says that the power of these interest groups is so strong that even people who would want to be president of the United States would say, well, they just have to be realistic about that. They just can't take it on. The power that is in this room The quality of heart that is in this room. Your understanding of the exercise and the capacity to have the courage to believe. Your faith in yourselves and each other is so powerful that here in Maine, you can create the forces that are needed to change the debate in America because we must insist that health care is not a privilege, it is a basic right in a democratic society, and everyone has a right to health care, and no one should be driven into poverty because they don't have health care. Hospitals would have a global budget. Physicians would either 
work through hospitals, or work for people in service. This is an idea whose time has not only come, but every other industrialized nation in the world provides care for its people. We're being told that no, you know, just isn't going to make it through Washington. Let me tell you what I intend to do. I see health care, the lack of access to health care, lack of affordability to health care, as being the number one domestic issue in America. And I believe that a campaign that goes around this country and rallies the American people in the cause of health care for all, saying that health care is a basic right, saying it's time to break the shackles which the insurance companies have on our health care system, saying it's time to have a true government of the people where health care is recognized as being something that it is the government's responsibility to take a stand on to make sure that everyone's covered and that we should have this single-payer system set up. This is the time to do it. We have that energy ready in vain. Thank you, Representative Bryant, for keeping the debate alive in the legislature. Let's move forward nationally to create this tremendous force so that we can make sure that we're the ones who created a system of health care that covered all Americans and no one would be driven into poverty again as a result of not having the access. of the IBEW and the CWA at a rally, and the rally was about the Verizon uh, attempt to sell its rural telecom business to Fairpoint. And one of the many reasons why Verizon is doing this is it really wants to crush the unions and dump the union contracts and cancel the benefits and jettison people's retirement. Because that's what a lot of these companies do, and that's what Verizon's about in this particular issue. Labor has been fighting a rear guard action with respect to health care issues. On the bargaining table, it's always about health care now. People can't bargain anymore for higher wages. They're bargaining not to get their health care benefits cut. They're bargaining to try to keep down the rate of growth, premiums, co-pays, and deductibles. I'm urging all of you to follow very carefully this issue relating to Verizon and the, and the CWA and the IBW, because it relates not only to rural telecom access and to fiber optics and broadband and whether there's going to be a digital divide that's going to be created by these companies and this uh, spin-off. But it really relates to whether or not rural communities are going to be able to have the economic viability down the road. If there's any organization that's up for this kind of a challenge, it's Maine People's Alliance. And I've indicated today that I'm standing with the rural communities and the unions representing the workers to file an action at the Securities and Exchange Commission and the FCC to block this action by Verizon and to hold a congressional investigative hearing on determining how in the world this matter has even gotten this far because it doesn't look like Fairpoint has any ability to carry out the obligations they're about to take. So I mention this because the solidarity that you're capable of with so many different groups as you put this alliance together is at the threshold of continuing to build. You're building throughout the state of Maine, but you're also, because of the spirit that's here in Maine, you also have the capability of reaching far beyond Maine and affecting national policy. When Elizabeth and I were, were sitting, listening to the individuals speak here, accepting their awards, one of the things that occurred to both of us and she sees all the way. She says, you know, she says, they're just like you. <laughs> and, and I have to tell you, I've never felt so much at home for all of you, for what you represent, for what you are, for who you are. And I can't thank you enough. And I'm so grateful to be here with a representative of uh, Congressman Deshue because uh, he has shown 
great courage. I yeah. wish you a stop in the program. Yeah. 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 And so I want to tell you something. I love the independent spirit of Maine. I love the spirit.